Uh, just give me one more minute and then we will begin. Uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. We are live on YouTube as well. And now here we have close to 110 participants other than the panelists, of course. And I have my colleague Ganesh here. Uh, he'll be assisting with the uh, with managing the session. Uh, so yeah, so as, uh, okay, good afternoon and good evening to everyone who's joined us. And uh, this, uh, Asia Pacific Cooperative Youth Summit. This is the third edition, and we are having it online this time. Uh, the theme for this uh, summit is celebrating uh, youth as torchbearers of cooperative identity. So in this session, uh, we will be highlighting successful case studies of uh, youth entrepreneurs who are um, making actual difference in the world, who are solving the problems of communities either through uh, cooperative entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship. So we have um, six entrepreneurs with us here. And I would like to uh, begin with uh, Ms. Susanna Tang from Singapore, who's the founder of uh, Urban Origins. And she's a youth advocate for food security and sustainability. So uh, I would like to request Susanna to start with your presentation. And if we'll have any questions for you, we will let you know. Thank you, Shivali. So I'll just begin. Hi, everyone. My name is Susanna, and I represent Urban Origins. This deck is just to share a little bit more about what we do and I'm open to having any questions from the floor uh, at the end of the session. So how did Urban Origins come about? In March 2020, uh, in Singapore at least, we woke up to scenes like these, leaving us with no access to fresh produce. And this episode gave me sleepless nights wondering about the world my son will be growing up in. My son's food future is my biggest motivation. So I quit the safety of my government job as a teacher and started to research on our nation's current food landscape. And in Singapore, we import over 90% of our food with only 1% of land that is allocated to agriculture. But in fact, we have plenty of local sources to get our food from. Why haven't we even heard of most of these brands and why did we have to scramble for food? And I found that upon doing research, the problem is that local food sources in Singapore compete on shelf space with imported food and are not differentiated on existing online platforms and in retail stores. So we came up with the solution of Urban Origins, a platform cooperative, one that is dedicated to all local food sources in Singapore. And we are a marketplace that aggregates local urban farm produce, food from agri and food tech companies, upcycled food, as well as home cooked fresh food with at least one ingredient that is locally sourced. And we sell them directly to consumer and businesses. So our members actually make up uh, our, 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 the home-based F&B owners as well as chefs, which are ordered, uh, eligible for ordinary membership, while local farms, food and agri-tech companies are eligible for associate membership. And what we found is that the home-based F&B sector in Singapore is severely underserved. They are resource constrained and oftentimes too small and struggle to hit minimum order quantities to get bulk pricing when they buy raw ingredients for their food. We also like business development and logistics support, and therefore that's why we want to support this community of food producers. To our merchants, we provide an increased visibility by dedicating our solution to local food sources, as well as providing marketing and outreach support for them. We help them bundle their products and share resources to facilitate collaborations for promotional activities. And our merchants will also be able to track real-time data on their sales, consumer preferences, and trends. 
For our customers, we provide a curated and dedicated list of local produce that is fresh and sustainable. And furthermore, we provide a variety of ready-to-eat food from our home-based F&B partners and the option of packaging their items into a gift, which is a feature that has garnered a lot of interest from consumers and corporates alike. Currently, we are in a stage where we are building our website, and this is how we have envisioned it to look. We are, launch we are looking at launching soon as well. I'll just skip this. So, so far, before we started on this journey of building Urban Origins, we did do our validation first, and we have conducted an online survey of 170 Singaporeans on their perceptions towards local produce. And we also, of course, uh, look out for other surveys done by other companies, such as the one done by Grow Asia in 2019 of 800 Singapore residents. And our survey findings actually match the results of their survey. And throughout, so far, we have conducted interviews with 41 other stakeholders, uh, including government organizations, as well as consumers to validate our solution. And from our research, we have these three target consumers that we are reaching out to as our early adopters. And they are the youth, young working mothers, as well as middle-aged affluent women, and also socially responsible organizations uh, that can come in and support our local food producer ecosystem. So far, we have also held pilot trials uh, before we sort of said that we do have a business model to work with. And we did an all local grocery box over Christmas and Chinese New Year and managed to hit our sales targets without any marketing spend. And apart from contributing to SDG2 food security and SDG12 responsible consumption and production, we also will engage single mothers for sorting, ex-offenders for fulfilling orders, and provide training to upskill our members in the home-based FMB sector. We will also be getting youths to volunteer their time uh, and um, promote the message of food sustainability and security. And to combat Singapore's food loss, uh, we at Urban Origins will monitor our food loss by weight and not based on write-offs. So I think uh, this is just a very short presentation about us. And our mission is actually to fortify our local food sources for the future of our food security. And we believe that our model is scalable and that Singapore can be a model for every city. And that is the world we hope our sons and daughters will grow up in, a food secure world. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I would like to just share a little bit more about the co-op and where we are now as well. So currently we are waiting for our marketplace to be live and we, are, we have already engaged about 30, close to 30 merchants to be onboarded onto our platform. And so far, I think what we have done uh, is maybe a few challenges that I've faced so far starting this co-op will be firstly getting um, a, like, a team of like-minded people and youths to drive the initiative forward uh, and to be also committed in the process and not just the core team, but rather even volunteers to come on board. Uh, that's one thing. Another, another challenge that I actually faced uh, growing Urban Origins would also be um, the changing people's mindsets to support local because in Singapore, the local food prices are in fact a little bit more expensive as compared to our imported sources from our neighbours. So that is something uh, that has been a challenge, but because of government support, we are seeing that more and more people are accepting lo um, local produce into their lifestyles. So I think I'd like to end the presentation here and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, so let me just tell all of you that uh, Urban Origins are also the winners for Creathon 2021. It is a competition organized for young uh, cooperative entrepreneurs like you only by our member in Singapore, uh, Singapore National Cooperative Federation. And uh, so that's how the idea, the Urban Origins originated during Creathon 2021. And today we have Sus uh, Susanna as the speaker presenting her initiative with all of you. So if you have any queries related uh, to if you want to know more about their work or about cooperative entrepreneurship or Creathon, you may please direct your queries to her in the Q&A tab. Thank you, Susanna. Um, now I would like to request Ms. Uh, Annaline Panerio. Uh, she is the general manager of Camp Sur Multipurpose Cooperative from Philippines. And she's been managing all the business operations of the cooperatives. So without... Uh, talking much i would like to yeah she's already started sharing her screen so the floor is yours thank you
Hi, good uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants of Asia Pacific Cooperative Youth Summit 3.0. Uh, I am Anilen Panario, uh, General Manager of Kamsur Multipurpose Cooperative, Philippines. Uh, I will in, I will share with you our uh, uh, experiences, my experiences as General Manager in developing the agriculture services to our farmer members, particularly on food value chain. So first, I would like to introduce our cooperative name, Kamsur Multipurpose Cooperative. So we have uh, 4,384 members and uh, we have one main office, one branch, one sat uh, two satellite offices, and uh, I have four 54 employees and we have uh, 25 uh, officers. Out of uh, 4,300 um Members of uh, members of our cooperative, uh, 2,519 of which, which is 58%, are farmers. Some are SMEs, overseas Filipinos, private employees, government employees, retired, and some are students. These are uh, children of our members who are also members of the cooperative from 18 age, 18 years old and above. So this is our concept first concept for agriculture. So on rice crop production management from land preparation, planting, water management, nutrition management, crop management, harvesting, and post-harvesting, we have identified, I have identified uh, the products and services needed by our palai farmers or rice farmers to support their crop production. So these are my initiatives. I have three initiatives on financial and technical support we have released production loan to those farmers uh, necessary for the sustainability of their crop production. We have released of 25 to 30 million every cropping season. And we also provided the uh, extension service. These are technical support on how to make sure that their production uh, uh, have a higher yield uh, as of the end of every cropping season. Second is input supply. So they needed the... Uh, uh, seeds and the uh, fertilizers for their crop production. So first for the seed grower, out of the 2,500 palai farmer, we have um, trained 25 out of 2,500 to be the seed grower producers. And the seed grower producers will uh, register their seeds to be a certified seeds that will be used by the 2,500 palai farmers. Then we, all, we became also the distributor of the fertilizer and all necessary inputs. So that is the, another business of the cooperative. Then lastly, our initiative on that rice production is uh, machineries and services. We have acquired different machineries uh, needed for the land preparation to the harvesting of our farmers, like for W tractor, transplanter. Uh, we also have uh, treasurer and combined harvester. Aside from that, we have also established post-harvest facilities like drying machineries and facilities, then rice mill. And these are some of the pictures of our uh, local palai farmers. These are the machineries uh, that we use to facilitate the, our, uh, the crop production of our farmers. So on the second, we also have uh, high value crops, vegetable fruits. So we also have identified the food value chains to make sure that all the, the produce of our members are being um, uh, assisted in uh, marketing their products. So from producers to collection and processing centers, we have uh, processing centers, then uh, uh, deliver it to the wholesalers, market, and retailers, and to the consumers. So that is the concept. So what is our initiatives? First, we acquired trucks ready to pick up, to, uh, to pick up for hauling purposes of those harvests of our farmers, particularly during the COVID period, we have lockdown. So uh, no one is allowed to go out in their respective areas. So our cooperative is the one who will go to their respective farm areas to, to uh, pick up their uh, harvest. Then we also created uh, store outlets as outright uh, outlets of those uh, harvested products. So we have a total of 20 outlets uh, managed and owned by our members. We also collaborated with the institutional buyers, wholesalers, and retailers. We have hospitals for their uh, patients. We have hotels. We have uh, restaurants. And online marketing through social media and house-to-house -house delivery, particularly during the pandemic. So these are the, some of the pictures of our uh, uh, producers, of our farmers, the vegetables. We picked the, the, the the vegetables, the fruits from their uh, land area, from their farm areas, then delivered to the institutional buyers. 
So this is the house-to-house -house during the Luzon-wide lockdown in the Philippines last year, 2020, where we delivered to each household of, uh, of their uh, needed, uh, uh, needed uh, food for their consumption. So these are our uh, actual deliveries. Yes. So what are the motivations to start this uh, food value chains, agribusiness uh, services to our palai farmers and high value products producers. First is food security and sustainability in the area of operation. Second is to create employment for people, enhance and improve the knowledge and skills in agriculture business because we have a lot of business in agriculture. Promote the local produce, of course, support our local farmers. And also an opportunity to earn more income. Another businesses, another opportunity, another income. And improve also the lives of our farmers and our co-op members. So how does this initiative solve the communities? Because of the different aspects concept on all the needed uh, services by our farmers, we have provided business opportunities. We have a lot of business opportunities. We also increase our employees, so provided employment. And we have supplied, sustained supply, agri inputs, products produced to the community even during the pandemic. So there is no hungry Filipino that time. And promoted and marketed our local produce. And regenerated high income and increased income savings and shares also because we encourage our farmer members for every uh, delivered goods a harvest we deduct a certain amount as additional savings and share capital for the cooperative. Okay. So how does the enterprise involve the youth? So more young farmers are encouraged to enter into agribusiness because of the presence of our cooperative. Also uh, operate and manage the cooperative business for newly hired employees because we created employment. Students were also hired as part-time employees during their SEM break classes. So for me, from uh, start to now, it's a, it's a roller coaster ride. <laughs> Exciting, every new business and operation, there are ups and downs and a lot of surprises, challenges and lessons. So what are the challenges and the lessons? Challenges one, lack of funds in, lend in lending uh, operations. So solution, we conducted capital savings mobilization activities of the cooperative, increased the savings of all members, and, and a little, uh, we have built external borrowing. Second, lack of skilled employees to handle business operations. So we conducted training, seminars, immersion, value formation, leadership, enhancement and development programs. And lack of machineries uh, necessary for the production of our farmers. So we collaborated with the government, particularly the Department of Agriculture for request for the machineries needed for the production. And of course, more competitors. It, it, it is very... Uh, real in the, in the business operation. So we promoted, uh, our solution promoted and marketed local products. Lo we promoted uh, our local products, members and wholesalers. So we have to innovate. We have in through social media. And future, land, future plan, expand membership, expand our business operation, increase farm production areas. We need more, more lands to till, store outlets, satellites and branches, improve and increase machineries and facilities to accommodate every needed uh, uh, support by our farmers and also produce organic fertilizer and inputs towards health and wellness for a long life. And my message to you, the youth, build good character. Second, do your best. Think small, but think big. That's all. Thank you very much and good luck everyone. Thank you, Ms. Annaline, for sharing such a well-summarized presentation with us. It followed the structure completely, which was shared. And uh, I must congratulate you for all the good work that you are doing with the agriculture cooperatives in the field of food security, providing uh, employment to youth. Um, anybody who's interested in agriculture, food security, or would want to know more about uh, what she's doing, please uh, share your questions in the Q&A tab. And we will later address these once the presentations are over. So uh, now I would, uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Annalie. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Chan Hong. Uh, he's from, he's the facility manager at Minsnail Housing Cooperative from South Korea. 
and it is a very interesting uh, cooperative by uh, youth and for youth who are trying to solve the housing problem for university students and uh, youth who uh, generally face issues to find housing uh, for themselves so um, yeah without uh, much ado uh, john may i request you to please start your presentation uh, sorry chan uh, yes can uh, everybody yeah. hear me uh yeah. Uh, yes, we can hear you well, and we can also see the presentation. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Chen, and I'm a facility manager for Binsnail Housing Coop, which is located in Seoul, Korea. Uh, uh, my presentation will be in three parts. Briefly, first, the Korean housing crisis, and then how we created the co-op, and then long-term goals. So what is mean snail? Uh, mean snail is a snail without a home. So we decided to call our generation the mean snail generation because we do not have adequate housing for uh, young people. So when we think about a home, we, we think about a place where we can rest, but also society views homes as things to invest in, uh, something that we need to buy, not where a place to live. So the lack of public housing in Korea uh, made a situation for young people where they couldn't get affordable housing. And even if they could afford housing, uh, the house, uh, the quality of the house wasn't regulated. So you could have really poor housing even if you pay a lot of money. So we created a uh, Minsnail Union, which is an activist organization in 2011. Uh, students were, uh, were requiring uh, the schools to create more dormitories and also the government to create more public housing for young people. So our mission is to uh, create change, institutional change, where uh, society will create public homes and also regulations for the private market so that uh, young people can have adequate housing. And also we, uh, we are realizing that we are the uh, main generation which are disadvantaged in this uh, market system in the housing market. So there are two organizations. One is Minsnail Union, the activist organization, and then Minsnail Housing Group, which is created in 2014 uh, to provide housing directly for ourselves. So why create a co-op? Uh, it was to show the government that nonprofit housing model is possible because it, has, it hadn't been done. The administrators in the government were reluctant to create this new model of nonprofit housing. And we could also show that we can live together and create a new way of living. Uh, we can stay in one area for a long time, which is really hard for young people to do because the house price and the uh, down payment keep, keep on rising in the Seoul city market. And also institutional change was slow. We had worked for four years to create institutional change, but still there were no uh, nonprofit housing provided for young people by the government. So we decided to provide our own house. So this is the picture of a map of our homes in Seoul. And there's also one in Bucheon and Jeonju. So the reason we can provide housing that is around 56% of the market price is because uh, a lot of funding was provided by the members. At first, uh, we created a home uh, for 17 people and 170 members all contributed to that funding. So, uh, a lot of people were interested in make, creating a nonprofit housing model. Uh, this, is, this is a kind of a chain of how you can come to a home. And first you sign up for membership and then apply for a house. And then you get a pre-tenant education. And then you can visit the home and visit the members of the house and then sign the contract. Also, there is a equality culture education, which everyone needs to listen to before coming to a snail house. Yes. Uh, in terms of uh, supplying our homes, uh, we have a lot of help from the public companies created by the government. The LH and SH, the Land and Housing of Korea and Seoul Housing, all uh, buy these apartments and then let other social enterprises run it. So we are running uh, a lot of homes uh, built by the government and we can lend these let, rent these houses at a very low price and then re rent it again to the students or young people. And we also run community programs 
and other educations about co cooperatives. So if you become a member, you can have uh, these, you can participate in the co-op. And one of them is you can participate in supplying houses, which means uh, you can design the homes yourself. This house behind me is was the first home that was built uh, by the co-op this year. And young people got together and they, uh, they talked about what kind of home was needed for the students. And we sent, sent that opinion to the architects. So we created a home for young people that fits the young people. So we have a common room in the first floor where you can well, study or work, especially in the pandemic because we have to work from home or you can cook together or, or watch movie on the sofa. And so this was a, a home made for young people by the young people. And we also have education where co-op members uh, pass on their culture to other co-op members of what it is to like in Snell House. Because Snell House is very different from other homes because we have uh, monthly meetings of uh, self-rule council. All the members of the house need to participate in this meeting and then we decide how to run this house. For example, how much common fee we're going to require and what, who is going to do the cleaning on what day and some activities that we want to, go, we want to do together, we can talk about it here. So you can participate in co-op community. And also lastly, you can participate in the youth housing agenda, which really led to the, uh, to the creation of this nonprofit housing model. Because we are originally an activist organization, we are very interested in all the uh, social pressure to shut this nonprofit nonprofit housing model down. Because when government tries to create uh, public housing for especially for young people, local residents uh, uh, really try to deny this from happening because of, because that they think that the house prices will fall down if you have nonprofit housing in this area. Yes. The long-term goal, goals of our co-op is cell phone snail houses. And this is possible because the city, uh, Seoul Metropolitan Government, rents us land uh, quite cheaply where we can build our own homes. And the loans that we can get from the commercial banks are backed by the government companies, which guarantee that uh, the rent will not go broke. And then we can sell back the house that we built after 30 years of running it which creates a stable uh, sort of environment for us to keep on going on this enterprise. Also, the tenant solidarity movement is uh, really important because Korean tenant society is very weak. Uh, uh, in contrast to landowners, we are not very organized and we have very low uh, housing rights compared to other countries. For example, we could only live in one home for two years uh, before last year when the law changed, which, may, which let us live in a home for at least four years with the house price rising by only 5%. So the sense of belonging in the snail house is important because we realize that we are tenants and also uh, realize we have housing rights. And lastly, this so, sort of recent advancement, we're trying to make our houses more green. So small things like uh, turning, off the, turning off the air, air conditioning while we sleep, things like that. We are, we are giving out the manuals for people living in our homes so that we can have a more energy efficient and sustainable home. Uh, thank you for listening and please feel free to contact us uh, by Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chan, for sharing this presentation. I think this is one problem which all of us, all youth present here can relate to. And if you're trying to solve this issue, that's uh, just wonderful. I myself has, has faced this issue as a young tenant in a different uh, state in my country. So I'm sure uh, people will be able to relate to it and they will appreciate your good work. So I would also like to ask from our participants here, Please let us know in the chat box what is that one challenge or one problem that you face in your communities and you would like to find a solution for that. So let us know in the chat box and if you have any questions for Chan, please direct them in the Q&A tab. Uh, so now I will request uh, Mr. John Hayes, uh, 
who is an English teacher. He's a traveler and also an anti-racist activist. He's a bit new to the cooperative movement, but he's uh, he wants to inspire the working class to organize and own their uh, workplaces. And he started with a platform cooperative, which is owned by teachers and educators. So, uh, Mr. John, may I please request you to switch on your video and share your work with us? Oh, is my is my video not on? Okay, uh, I couldn't see it earlier. Oh, okay. Now it's, it's <laughs> yeah. Okay, it is on. Great. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I'm very uh, happy to have been invited to come and speak here today. Um, so my name is John. I'm originally from California, USA. I've been living in Warsaw, Poland for almost six years now. Um, and I have been teaching online English for about six years as well, too. Um, so since I started teaching English online, this is my first job in a very, very long time working for someone else. I've always been an entrepreneur and been self-employed uh, working back home. So when I started teaching English online, I noticed that, you know, parents were paying very high prices for online education. I, I was working for a Chinese uh, company and parents are paying, you know, 50, 60, 70 dollars an hour for tuition and teachers are getting paid six, eight, 12, 25 if they're lucky. Um, so I, you know, I noticed a lot of venture capital being dumped into the online teaching industry, especially uh, when the pandemic hit. Online education is supposed to reach 350 billion by 2025. And that was before the pandemic. China has already reached, I think, around 198 billion on its own. Um, that what's expected within the next year or so. Um, so what I wanted to do with my cool class is, you know, I see all these other companies and platforms, all of them, uh, and they have, you know, very exploitative hiring practices. I'm a native speaker, but I've traveled all around the world and I've met lots of English teachers from countries that have never been to an English speaking country. They're non-native. Um, and they're just as qualified as I am or even more qualified. So I see a lot of you know, um, racism and discrimination within online teaching as and this carries on with these companies' marketing practices as well too. Um, you know, glorifying even native speakers as being better by default. They're demanding degrees from people, but they don't care what the degree is in. It could be on fashion design, which has nothing to do with you know, teaching per se. So, um, you know, and as well as a company I used to work for, Filipino teachers were teaching the same exact curriculum I was with the same exact students. And they were making, you know, five dollars, five US dollars an hour where the native counterparts were making, you know, 18 to 24. So I saw that as a major problem, as well as the amount of money that these companies are sucking from both teachers and from students all for profit. Um, so I really saw that as a problem. I saw teachers' wages getting lower while students were paying more. And the last year, bored in lockdown, I, you know, I really wanted to do something better. I didn't want to start my own company. I've done that before, and that's a headache of its own. Um, and I, there's so many teachers now that are branching off to become independent, to become freelancers. So my cool class is kind of a happy medium that's going to, you know, will make everyone happy at the end. So how it works now is, Freelance teachers all around the world, uh, they do not, it's not for English, you can teach, you know, dance, you can teach art, math, uh, whatever, coding, um, drawing, anything you want. So all teachers from around the world are welcome to join. They pay a small onboarding fee, no more than 25 pounds, and that's if you're from a high income country. So a lot of other countries, you know, could be as low as five pounds to join. Um, the co-op takes a 19% uh, fee for 
from all teachers. Teachers set their own prices. They offer their own courses. They are in full control. My cool class uh, takes a 19% contribution, which is significantly lower than these other platforms, which some are charging even, you know, 40, 50, 60% um, of a teacher's salary. So, um, our, so our fee is actually very low. And then this fee is going into just basic overhead and operations, uh, running the platform website, um, worker overhead. And then it's going to come, we're also going to be offering paid time off for freelancers, which is pretty much unheard of anywhere in the freelance world. So that is actually gonna be a member benefit. So teachers will accumulate seven days paid time off based on their average daily salary. They can only take out what they put in. So this is really just to be a cushion since so many teachers are gig workers, no different than you know Uber, Lyft, or Deliveroo uh, you know, drivers. So um, yeah, teachers can afford to actually get sick for a couple days. Or if they wanna take a week long vacation at the end of the year, they can and they're not gonna lose income. So you know, for your average working class, you know, person or teacher, um, that's huge just to be able to have that opportunity since so many platforms actually punish teachers for canceling classes or getting sick. So um, that was really my motivation behind it. So, um, you know, and also how it solves community problems. It cuts down costs for parents and students wanting to, you know, learn online because it is the new thing and it's not going away even after coronavirus goes away. Online education will not go away. It's only going to expand. Um, this also helps a lot of community problems because you have these wealthy investors dumping tons of money in. They're, you know, they're making returns of 20 to 40 percent to profit, which is millions and millions and millions getting sucked out of, you know, the global economy and being hoarded in banks. So, um, you know, we're actually going to be using that as one of our marketing pitches um, on why people should take lessons with my cool class. Uh, teachers will go ahead and build, um, you know, their patronage and equity shares. Teachers can buy shares in the cooperative, which is going to be, you know, uh, which is going to be great for building capital and um, expanding in a huge market right now. Um, me living in Poland and being then from the United States, my cool class is actually a registered cooperative in the United Kingdom. So. Um, we, there were a lot of struggles when I wanted to start up. It started as my own idea and I reached out to other teachers. I reached out to my, to my girlfriend who's a graphic and web designer and really Michael class is built mostly on sweat equity. Um, just labor from talents that we all had and had very little money to start up. Uh, we had 2000 teachers pre-registered to join. Uh, so we had really a really big um, turnout for that. We have opened our doors on July 1st. So we've only been open, you know, less than a month now. So we're just now starting to get students on. And we have onboarded over 200 teachers from all around the world, uh, you know, Africa, Asia, South America, um, everywhere. So it's really, really cool what we have going on right now. Um, so our future plans is just growing. We want to reach a thousand teachers within the next couple months. Uh, that's going to ensure we have enough capital to, you know, market and uh, start to compete a little bit. We have a, you know, very good uh, business plan. We're actually taking a couple different models from different companies since there are a wide variety of teachers out there that have completely different, you know, models. So my cool class kind of incorporates all of them as far as bringing on private students, being able to get your own students, do uh, group courses. And again, it could be, you know, anything. I'm not gonna offer a, a hitchhiking course. I spent a year hitchhiking. So, you know, you can offer really fun, unique classes like that as well too. Um, Probably the biggest problem we have right now is we are not reaching out to the cooperative community. We're reaching out to teachers. We're reaching out to most people that know nothing about cooperatives. A lot of them think it's a you know multi-level marketing scheme. Um, so there's a really one of the biggest challenges 
explaining to people in very basic, simple knowledge um, or simple language on what a cooperative is, um, how it functions, and how it will really benefit everyone um, involved in, in the cooperative. So that has been the biggest, biggest struggle. And then other people read a little bit about it. And then other people like, okay, I want to, I want to vote right now. So, uh, <laughs> like, okay, you, you just, you just filled out your application. So there's a really a lot of struggle on just getting the message across on what is a cooperative, getting teachers to join in. And, you know, right now in the height of a pandemic, uh, investing 25 pounds could make or break a lot of teachers, regardless of where they live in the world. Um, so um, yeah, those are oh, and our, another big problem is uh, building capital. You know, raising our upfront capital. Um, overall, our overhead expenses are going to be quite low compared to you know other similar operations that just have exuberant fees. Um, but yeah, we're just really trying to get on our feet. So we're hoping in the next uh, three months we can organize. You know, we started off with just two, three people, and now we have over 200 within a month and a half. So uh, organizing, filling in all those key shoes, that has been a challenge, but we are doing it. We have a website up. We have a lot of people getting involved, and it's just growing, growing, and growing. Uh, my message to youth looking to start up. Um, I have been a troublemaker since I was a little kid, and I think that being into the cooperative movement, you have to be a little bit of a troublemaker. You're going against society's norms. So what I recommend everyone do is just go with your heart, go with your gut, forget everyone else, um, forget all the naysayers, just, um, you know, think big and go for it. You know, there's always going to be problems. Figure it out. My my background before teaching is I was actually a private detective. There's really no skill needed to be a private detective, except for being really, really, really good at figuring things out. That is the challenge. So um, yeah, if you see a problem, overcome it, throw it away, get around it, find that loophole, talk to the right people, meet the right people, be loud. My cool class started with two people putting up a website and spamming Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So be loud, 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 and be proud of it. So um, thank you all. Um, that's all. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, John, for sharing the work, uh, the wonderful work that you do. And I think we've all been a troublemaker at one point in our life. And now you're uh, solving a lot of troubles for a lot of people. And uh, definitely, if the world starts, uh, you know, uh, considering education as a service and not as a business, we can actually make a difference. So on that note, um, I would like to now uh, invite uh, Ms. Navita. Uh, she's the co-founder of Karunachal Foundation and the founder of We Transform. Uh, she identifies herself as a free-spirited green entrepreneur and yoga practitioner. And uh, she, uh, they, the Karunachal Foundation, they are into environment consciousness teaching. And they are also a young uh, startup uh, working with young uh, young people and for young people. So uh, Navita, may I please request you to share your presentation? Um, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, Shivali, uh, would you be able to share the screen for me, please? Just give me a moment, I'll open that. Okay. You can see the screen now? Yes. 
All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shivali. I'm really grateful to be on this platform. My name is Navita, and uh, I'm a co-founder of this organization called Karunachal. So, um, you know, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our journey and where we are. Okay, it's not going to be a very uh, technical presentation, but it's more more, more of going to be like a story with a lot of pictures. So this is actually where our, uh, you know, journey began. Uh, go to the next slide. So Karunachal actually is um, is a what do you say is an organization that came from uh, experiences of me and my co-founder. So um, Spiti Valley is a trans Himalayan desert. Okay, uh, it's a cold desert uh, in the Himalayas, and uh, my journey into sustainability and environment consciousness began over here. Uh, what happened was when being a typical city uh, person. I live in Bangalore, uh, a city in India, which is a metro city. And um, yeah, so from from there, uh, you know, going going to a village life and really living in the village, uh, which is some of the most remotest parts of uh, the world. Okay, so in fact, till 1990s, uh, this part wasn't this part of the world wasn't even in touch with the rest of the world, right? So um, just living there really changed my uh, whole perspective on life itself and about how uh, you know it's it's the struggles of the people you know especially when it comes to uh, sustainability or you know environment consciousness because uh, everything has changed you know in in terms of how they really live versus how they used to live because of the influence of you know modern day uh, society Right. So uh, the next slide. Um, Shwali, could you just please move to the next slide? Just a moment. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And my co-founder, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't be here because of a family emergency. But uh, his also experiences similar uh, ha were similar and also began in Himachal in uh, you know a place called Parvati Valley, which is again a part which is very remote uh, in in Himachal. Again, a lot of struggles and a lot of uh, you know things. So he actually built a cafe from scratch by living with the locals and the communities there. Okay, so he ended up building, uh, spending about six months to just, you know, procure wood from the forest to actually build the cafe, you know, from scratch to help the local community to, uh, you know, sort of raise uh, their income levels and to become, a, uh, you know, become a, what do you say, self-sustainable. All right, so that's where his journey began uh, next and uh, both of us actually met in this social entrepreneurship uh, fellowship that we did. And uh, we studied social entrepreneurship. So when, when my, my journey, which began in Himachal again, led me to understand, you know, to, to question that, you know, okay, what, is it possible to really work on issues which, which, you know, remote parts of the world really suffer from, especially when it comes to education uh, and, you know, environment, right? So that's where, you know, our journey began um, next again. So uh, similarly, Alistair also joined the program. So we never knew each other before, uh, but we were working in different parts. You know, coincidentally, we ended up meeting, uh, you know, at this particular fellowship. He was from the second cohort. And um, yeah, basically began our journey of Karunachal actually began at the end of this, uh, you know, fellowship. Uh, the next slide. So basically what happened was uh, we met and we decided to really explore the different parts of uh, the country because we weren't really clear on how do we really work on environmental education. You know, uh, for a country like, like India, which is plagued with so many, many problems, right? Uh, it, you know, environment is not really one of the primary concerns when there are people who, uh, you know, are struggling to get food, uh, so many things, right? Like day-to-day -day living itself becomes a problem. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Shivali? 
so this is basically where uh, you know we we decided that we have to uh, identify really what the problem is um, what is the exact problem that we really need to work on when it comes to environment right and uh, we were traveling at that point of time and we uh, happened to spend uh, you know some time in this small village uh, in in south india and uh, we ended up working with all of these kids right so it was very, what started off was a very simple idea so we started asking them so this is a wildlife sanctuary where you know all these kids live in so the entire town is a wildlife sanctuary right and you see that you know those the locals themselves destroy the space where they live in right and um, it's not just the tourists who come and destroy the, the place with the garbage that they leave behind but it's also the locals so we started working there uh, you know trying to do scavenger hunts talking to them about what is uh, you know single use plastic and then making them do scavenger hunts on that we used football as a means yoga as a means to kind of communicate these messages uh, to get them together and uh, that's when the pandemic actually began and we had to get back to our own cities uh, can you move to the next slide and uh, we you know like it, we end up we ended up spending a lot of time really thinking what do we really do because you know what six months of our work had had to be completely you know moved online or shifted online how do we really work on environmental education online that too when you're working with rural communities right and uh, we we just decided to believe in ourselves and you know just keep going forward right and uh, from here next slide so from here what happened was we um, ended up you know refocusing rethinking how do we really want to work and we this is where it started getting interesting right uh, we contacted other people who uh, want to be collaborators right and we got collaborators together to bring about you know certain messages so we believe that sustainability has three pillars one is self awareness if you cannot you know be uh, aware about your own self then you can't think about anything else right and then comes environment consciousness because one is your internal environment and then comes what is there which is happening in the world and both are interconnected right and from there we also realized that we can't ignore entrepreneurship because that's also a key part of it businesses which don't care about the environment then ends up creating a bigger problem uh, you know which is is again so difficult to like again solve and uh, address right so we uh, hosted about 15 online workshops uh, and uh, you know again we realized that through this 15 workshops we realized that our message wasn't really coming through okay we, because we were using different different mediums somebody was teaching art somebody was teaching music somebody taught yoga uh, somebody taught growing plants but the real essence of sustainability wasn't coming through because the kids who were joining the workshops had their own agenda or had their own thought processes right uh, the next slide so we ended up uh, you know speaking to um, different people right we ended up uh, speaking to leaders from uh, you know different spheres trying to understand how we can make uh, or how can we really enable the youth of of uh, you know the country to be more conscious and responsible that was the only question we ended up asking a lot of people right and it was very hard for a lot of people to also articulate what is consciousness what is responsibility and why should you even be responsible towards the earth you know so we ended up speaking to a lot of people um, next slide and um, from there you know we uh, again restarted our work okay and by this time you know uh, india had opened up uh, you know uh, the lockdown and people were moving so we thought we'll move to an offline space uh, you know of working on immersion programs uh, with youth and uh, with uh, you know families and things like that that again did not work so we we launched about four to five programs collaborated with different people with different organizations to put things together and uh, you know it again did not work out so one two were uh, you know farm emotions uh, field emotions one was an online growing workshop and one more was a yoga based camp so we were trying grappling with different different ways in which we can really communicate uh, this message right um, next slide <clears throat> uh, shwali can you please move yeah 
so from there we uh, also felt sick okay so both my co-founder and i ended up uh, you know getting covid and we were also like we had to take a back seat for a while and then that just gave us a lot of time to reflect and think about you know what is the problem and how do we really uh, you know work again towards it right restart so we started doing things in our own capacity so i started making uh, bioenzymes i started looking at my own life and seeing where all we can make changes started with all the cleaning products at home so all cleaning products at my place is all made by me using kitchen waste okay and we started growing our own food uh, at home so that in one of the pictures that's my father uh, so we are we're not growing everything but we're growing some bits of our uh, you know food at our own home uh, started making vinegar started making uh, you know for uh, what do you say uh, fertilizers for our plants at home uh, started making our own compost started making our own cello tape which is i'm um, not cello tape what do you call that tape sticky tape to actually use for packaging and things like that uh, started making our own diy products for all our personal care uh, you know for hair for skin everything at home right and it's been it's been an incredible journey uh, you know for us living this ourselves and uh, the next slide so similarly uh, at the same time um, my co-founder who lives in the coastal parts of uh, you know karnataka uh, he you know um, spoke to some people and got this space of land where uh, you know he they transformed this land to look something like this right which is uh, you can see now how it looks and uh, in the next slide you can see where it is right now and it's just about a uh, work of about 6 months or so right so the progress has been so uh, has been this way right so we started uh, going on ground growing our own food experimenting and you know now we are able to grow like some amount of food for ourselves and uh, what we realized through all of these things next slide is that um, uh you know to keep learning to keep experimenting right and we have to live true to our own experiences uh there will be opportunities to learn from different communities different people uh, there will be a lot of failures at least that's one thing that we have realized throughout our entire journey because we started off at a time when you know the pandemic began and and the work our work also is not very pro uh you know the situation that we live in so yeah we we've, we've learned we've come a long way in terms of you know how do we really want to work on our issues and currently what we are doing is uh, we we've recruited two interns and as part of our youth empowerment program and uh, we are working with them to create local communities in the cities which uh, you know can share okay so coming up in the next 2 3 weeks we have a local uh, you know community meeting in bangalore where you know somebody is sharing their venue space somebody is coming and sharing certain skills so different people about 30 people uh, you know who are sustainability enthusiasts are coming together to really share their uh, you know journey and their products or their you know different things and there's no monetary involvement at all so it's just about really just sharing um So yeah that's that's where we are uh go, please go on to the next slide and i think that's it from from our side we're still figuring out how to really work on uh you know uh, spreading the message of environment education to everybody and uh, i'm sure that you know we'll get there some day of you know being able to do that uh, but till then we continuing to experiment and you know uh, do our best so thank you guys thank you everyone thank you navita for sharing your uh, uh, great work with us uh, i think it's often very difficult to practice what you preach but you are doing the opposite of it trying to uh, produce all the things that we use on a daily basis uh, at home and then using them as well so i wish you all the best for all, all your good work and i'm sure you'll definitely reach there one day um So yeah now from environment we shift to a completely different subject that's technology and incubation and i would like to invite anis who is the who is our old friend and uh, she's the co-founder and ceo of inno circle initiative which is a cooperative uh, that incubates other uh, startup cooperatives so anis uh, yeah you can please start your presentation 
Okay, um, thank you Sifali for the time and hello everyone, good evening from Indonesia. Um, my name is Anissa Ada, you can call me Anis and short, uh, maybe I would like to introduce myself first, short uh, background of myself is I have joined the movement and cooperative business since college until now, until today. And some people, some young generation, choose a career in the cooperative as a second or maybe third choice after a civil servant, state-owned enterprise, or other benefit companies. But I choose a cooperative career in the first choice, and I think I'm proud of it. Um, we also in here don't use a college degree. Um, we use a cooperative degree that we create by ourselves. It's called Etsy uh, or Homo Cooperativus, which is usually placed after our name, such as Anissa Ada, Etsy, and et cetera. Well, I initiated several co-op uh, since student, and then of course, mostly of them is failed. And uh, currently, I running a startup co-op incubator. Uh, it's called uh, InnoCircle Initiative, and uh, uh, we started in 2018, where we saw the rapid growth of a digital startup. But cooperative institution in here, it does it didn't respond by initiating these inno innovative things. And in the other hand, cooperatives are dominated by baby boomer uh, and not many millennials in here familiar with co-op. So we hope uh, this model uh, can invite more young people and this hybrid model uh, can um, push more uh, co innovative, co more uh, startup co-op uh, burn in, in Indonesia. So we learned that digitalization takes in an essential role in the framework of life in the future, of course, and however many technology research results stop in the laboratory. And we are here to requiring um, to commercial, commercial uh, the technology and can give an impact on a business and also the social uh, economic growth. And this is the scheme uh, between our stakeholders where we, we collapse uh, through university, community, and where we get the funding. And one of them is co-op, bank, private company, and individual. And university, we need them for research and development, mentorship, and uh, human resource, talent, and community, where we get uh, our customer partnership, media, and working, and hopefully, through uh, collapse, all those multi stakeholders, we can burn our uh, new enterprises or start up co op. And why cooperative? Because ownership is matter. Well, our founding father uh, said that there is no political democracy without economic democracy, and I agree with him. And the system to make it happen is cooperative because the ownership and the control of capital asset and essential, or we, can, we can say it as an age of capital is to be a reason. First, because it enables people to diversify against the risk of change. And then the second, because it establishes of ownership right is how the market and our labor system determine the distribution and the return to those um, aforementioned before. Well, the awareness of ownership must be increased, starting from the concern for data platform and the state ownership enterprises and the company which related to them. And here we involve, of course, young people because young people is the pillar of our sustainability uh, of our institution that promote innovation. So we involve student and first graduate. We want to self uh, capacity development, train entrepreneurship and the cooperative. Then uh, how's our my cooperative journey? Well, I feel that um, it's quite long, maybe around five more eight years in co-op. I feel like a dating trip because I started by falling in love in co-op and then in the midway, I was heartbroken because I found fact that a lot of fraud, bad image, nothing a reason to fight in this co-op. And then finally I fall in love again with co-op because I, I have figured a many thing uh, actually in co-op. First that, well, someone said uh, in cooperative is people first capital behind. Well, I agree with it as an institutionally, but whatever, uh, but in business, 
whatever the noble purpose of cooperative, the main reason why we build a cooperative when doing a business, we have to still make it profit. And then the second, I figure that uh, people don't care about the company ownership, such as we give an ownership to the user, because in the free market, the customer tend to be more pragmatic. What they care is about uh, what is our value proposition? Uh, is it profitable from them? Uh, how's our good service, discount, packaging, etc. That's the fact. And then the third, I figure also that ownership doesn't guarantee the loyalty of worker owner of the cooperative because um, cooperative employee turnover is also no less high than other companies. One of the things that currently employee value, one uh, is salary, environment, and the other business management variable. And then uh, for that, why we necessary to start co-op first before platform co-op because I have been experienced in here. Uh, uh, we realized that startup has a 99% risk of failure. It will be very gambling if we get the capital from the user or other public. If they fail, they will accuse that cooperative of being incompetent in a running business as the case in many cases in Indonesia. We don't want to repeat this to make a more authentic word cooperative. Uh, this is maybe more specific in Indonesia because there's a lot of uh, cooperative have bad image because they uh, incompetent control their management. So uh, I don't want to give more bad image in the co-op. So uh, startup co-op uh, also make uh, the worker owner as uh, in the co-op, uh, startup co-op first. And then uh, this is our my journey starting from 2018. We already incubate for Beach, where a year we incubate uh, one season is six months. And then we already incubate 50 tenant. Tenant is called maybe um, uh, 50 company uh, startup and also SME. And we already 70 coaching class and mentor, 20 mentor coach and 35 startup top. And we also replicated in five uh, area or residence. And what we what our service first is mentor technology and a business, co-working space, funding, networking, venture builder, and technology support. And this is um, some of our tenant from Star Digital, Domo, blah, 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 blah. This is a specific category in uh, Star Digital and then uh, SME and Cooperative we also has it. And one of them also winning uh, first hack Athen Asia Pacific last year, 2020, and we proud of it. And then this is uh, some of our activities from the startup talk where we gather our community, our um, the way we educate uh, young people about the cooperative, uh, the reason why ha they have to win the cop, um, et cetera, and the CEO on table. Mostly we gather only the CEO where they share how the obstacle running a business, pitch competition, uh, we invite investor, we invite the business uh, idea who can share the, the most, most interesting and then to make uh, the investor give them funding. And then the last is coaching and mentorship, the way we call uh, teachers and also the business practitioner to, to give motivation or to share their experience uh, to our tenant. This is some of our achievement for Hack Athens Asia Pacific 2020. And then we also being part of the LPDB. The LPDB is, uh, um, how it say, it's from the cooperative ministry, uh, specific on funding. And then we also get the angel investor from the existing uh, cooperative Indonesia. And the last, we also audience to the cooperative ministry. Uh, and then what's the future plan? We want to encourage or replicate this in a cycle model in various areas to be developed where our institution is supported by the local uh, cooperative and currently in a cycle model has been replicated in a five region because I think that this is the first uh, model where cooperative um, giving or bird uh, supporting the uh, incubator. And then uh, talking about the obstacle and the advantage um, we want, I wanna maybe the solve the how to solve it is um, this is just uh, the scam. Um, we need to 
we need to sit down with the cooperative that already exists today with the sufficient capital they have a lot of experience in cooperative to spin off to the new innovative cooperative business model based on the technology so that there is the right synergy between the existing cooperative and the birth of startup co initiated by young people and able to answer the need or problem of the existing uh, cooperative or maybe we can talk if in here any boomers hi boomers we are millennial and we need, need to talk cooperative seriously because um I uh, realized that it's very difficult to get a capital from the limited uh, or private company because I, as a cooperative, they didn't interest with the scheme. And then some of um, uh, venture capital asked me to, to invest on my tenant, but because cooperative, they didn't agree. And that's why we have a limited uh, access to the capital but I do believe that if cooperative also supporting younger or uh, give uh, young people to uh, access the model it get more easier so this is the scheme where we can collaborate uh, any stakeholder and also this is our um, structure in 2020 there is uh, run by five young people and then this is our um, stakeholders um, Okay, and the last, maybe uh, what we can share and invite for uh, other uh, young people outside of there. Uh, first, if you are interested in the entrepreneurship and the cooperative, I think cooperative is the most rational model to start a business where you have a lot of limited capital, network, knowledge, and the mentor. To become business owner, you must collectively share risks and a strategy to accelerate business growth. But if you are currently working in the cooperative, the cooperative is not a default model. It must comply with the old laws and regulations. Always ask question and raise anxiety so you can imagine and the brook and break the old way of working in cooperative because we cannot we cannot make change if you use the old ways. That's it. Um, thank you for attention and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anis. Thank you very much for sharing the work. Uh, as you rightly say that you want to attract young people to join the cooperative movement. And I think you are rightly doing so by uh, with this incubator of yours and uh, helping other young startups to start their enterprises. Uh, so with Anis's presentation, uh, we have finished all our presentations. And I would now like to invite any questions from our attendees if they have uh, for the speakers. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you would like to speak and we will allow you to talk and then you can ask your question to them. You can share your questions in the Q&A tab, chat box, or just raise your hand. Um, okay, so I would start with one question for all of you. Um, I would want to know your opinion on how social media can help young startups or young entrepreneurs to grow their business or how it can provide more opportunities. So uh, maybe we can start with Anis only. Uh, Anis, uh, what's your opinion on this? I'm sorry, pardon me, I didn't hear that. Yeah, so the question was, how do you think uh, social media can help in further growing your business? Uh, it can help young uh, cooperators or young uh, entrepreneurs in getting more opportunities or growing their businesses. Uh, yeah, I think it's very uh, important currently because I also has experience starting a business uh, with a minimum viable product, which means I have no product, but uh, I give it to the uh, stakeholder, other stakeholder, and I only um, use a social media. I mean, this is very important to give a trust to the customer and our brand it's important because most of our time 
when in the pan in this pandemic uh, we have a lot of time in the social media so there we go social media is very important to give uh, us in attention even though social media is very noise uh, it need us to be more creative how we can get uh, the attention for netizen uh right right thank you anis uh so i would ask the same question to chan uh, maybe uh, chan would you like to share uh yes uh, as we uh, we don't have much marketing funds we usually try to use uh, word of mouth from youth to youth and we try to make events for example if one friend invites another friend to live in uh, one of our homes then we have uh, we cut the first rent first month of rent by half 50% for the person who recommends it and for the people who comes in newly to our home so things like that we try to make a viral marketing through them and also we use instagram and also our uh, online real estate platforms are really popular in korea uh, young people use a lot of uh, online platforms uh, websites to find houses and we try to use those because it doesn't cost very much but a lot of people watch it thank you right right okay uh, so uh, miss annaline i would want to know from you uh, since you work with agriculture cooperatives and your uh, members mostly include farmers or agriculture producers so how do you or how does your cooperative use uh, social media for its benefit okay social media is a, a very low cost low cost expenses in managing and marketing and promoting of our products and services so it is very uh, helpful activity for all the youth to open a new business because it will expose you to uh, higher or more uh, potential clients markets customers so you will not be limited only to your local areas to your uh, to your province but also it will be open markets to national international also international customers so bigger opportunity lesser cost so that is uh, the uh, a great opportunity for the youth to now because you are more exposed and you can access to all media marketing activities thank you right um so yeah the same question to john as well since you are relatively new and i often see posts from my cool class on our social media channels as well so would you like to share your opinion on that sure um you know social media especially talking facebook instagram google twitter what else you know it's evil no one likes it but it is very 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 necessary um, if you are trying to grow your brand or business, it's just something you have to uh, kind of bargain with. And especially, you know, if the co-op movement as a whole wants, you know, a fighting chance to really grow and build and multiply and multiply and multiply, we are going to have to use, you know, traditional means to get our message across. Um, my cool class, for example, you know, um, and also one thing that's important to realize, you know, if you're a business owner is social media is an art and a profession completely in and of itself. So it doesn't matter if you've done marketing, you know, 15 years ago, that really means nothing right today. It's changing every couple of weeks. So, um, you know, finding someone to do social media management that is experienced is very critical. Um, you know, we don't like our data being collected, you know, by, you know, Facebook or big business. There's a lot of talk about that. But also, you know, if you are a small cooperative, you can actually find through these targeted ads, your most likely customer who, you know, um, if you're trying to pitch an idea for, you know, like selling little, like, you know, um, cut lessons for little kids. Well, okay, if we're marketing here, well, what else do little kids like? How else can we angle that? So you can actually find your specific, you know, demographics that you want to come over to your platform. So I think if more and more people, um, you know, can start spreading, you know, the message about their business, but in cooperatives as a whole, 
And like I was saying, you know, earlier about it's really hard to get new people to understand what a cooperative is without throwing, you know, a book at them saying, hey, read this. And most people have no interest in, you know, reading a whole book to learn something that someone told them. So, um, you know, I think social media is going to be very, very important. There are a lot of big cooperatives. Um, I know in the United States you have, you know, REI, Ace Hardware, Ocean Spray, but no one even thinks of them as cooperatives. So you have to think about, you know, a little bit with the branding as well, too. Well, I think people would have a much different perspective of cooperatives if it was REI cooperative. Everyone buys their backpack and snowboarding gear there. Um, so I, I think if, um, you know, we use social media, good branding, you know, proper branding, um, as well as, you know, good graphics and media, it all plays a role in brand building. It all plays a role. And there's good marketing and bad marketing, um, effective marketing and ineffective marketing. So, um, you know, and that is uh, tried and you know, something that you have to try, fail, make corrections on and keep growing and growing and growing. And that's really what my cool class is doing. We're in those starting stages of really trying to take over on a global scale of social media. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. So I see one question in the chat for Chan. Um, how do you, it is from Ganesh. So, okay. Uh, so Chan, you've already answered it, but I would like you to please uh, answer it for all our participants. So the question is, how do you reach out to your community, community and how do you manage uh, expansion? Uh, I think there's a lot of demand for housing that is affordable, especially in Seoul metropolitan area, because we provide housing at about 45 to 50% of market rate. Uh, de the demand really is higher than the supply. So we really spent a small amount, but we got really much demand from other people. And how, how this spread is word of mouth and also by our networks, because we are connected to Youth Union, which is a all Korean labor union or with a lot of branches in Korea and also other youth networks such as uh, youth centers which is created by local governments and also social economy centers which is uh, stationed around the city to help the social economy and they help us uh, to uh, advertise our homes through their social networks and also the Seoul housing which provides the houses that we run they have a huge, they have a website which is seen by millions of young people and they advertise our homes there for us. So, thank you. Okay. Now, you want to speak? Okay. Uh, thank, you so thank you so much, uh, Chan. Uh, I think uh, community housing for students is a problem that we've all faced, uh, at least uh, at, at some point in life when going to college. And particularly in the city, housing is a nightmare. You either have to, you know, have a bunker bed on top of somebody's attic or stay with one of your aunts. But if you don't have either, then you're pretty much in a, in a very bad situation. So this is very interesting. And I think uh, uh, this is something that should be emulated in all big cities or all medium tier cities across the globe. So um, my question was most uh, more focused on as to how you give it at a discount. You already explained that. Secondly, the other question which you answered in chat, but uh, I would like to ask you that again for the benefit of our uh, of our viewers. Uh, you say that ultimately there is a lot of pressure groups um, um, versus local community uh, 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 frictions that happen when you go to a particular area. And which, which because of market forces, you can understand that uh, when there is a perception or an image of uh, affordable housing coming to an area, the overall market uh, uh, rates of property rates go down. So, you know, like the American economics, they call it uh, voting with your feet and moving from one county to the other. Um, you know, the, even the, the local governments at some point might uh, turn hostile or things like that. So just wanted to understand how you, uh, you know, deal with this particular unique problem because localites or local residents, they are also part of community and community ultimately stands for what a cooperative stands for. I mean, cooperative stands for the community. So there's a conundrum right there. How do you manage this friction between the student community versus the local community? 
Oh, you're right, because a lot of dormitories and public housing is frustrated by the local, uh, local how do you say, dissent to mm -hmm. all these projects. And uh, one, we, tr we try to advocate in these, uh, these events, which happen all around Seoul City and also outside. But usually uh, we lose a lot of times because uh, big projects, uh, they are, which are created in uh, rich, rich areas, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. Hmm. But they attract a lot of attention and then the residents don't want the houses in the area. And usually the small projects, smaller projects like uh, apartment of five stories or less or people with uh, 20 to 25 people living in a home, these attract less, less attention and even the neighbor, neighbors don't have to know about it, that they're building. Oh, even. Okay. So this, uh, this small house projects has really worked. And most of our homes are people with 25 people or less. So we have, uh, we didn't have much uh, attention, but the house which I'm living in right now, we had a lot of attention from people in this neighborhood. And so we got, because this is our home base neighborhood, we had a lot of organized youth and networks. So we held a, a sort of a conference. We invited the journalists to come and take photos and, we uh, protested outside the local government office. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> so the media really turned towards uh, the nim NIMBY, the people, local residents. So the local okay. residents were forced to come to the table and they were to compromise. And we said, okay, we'll open our home, our common room from uh, 1 p.m. in the afternoon to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And the local kids from ele elementary schools can come here. And the parents who pick up the kids can come here and stay uh, and as their rest area. So we kind of had a compromise with local residents, but this is a really rare case because most of the times with big projects in bigger, richer neighborhoods, uh, it doesn't really work. Absolutely. Thank you so much on that, Chan, because often in developing countries like India, China, all these places, there is always a debate between development, what it means for each individual. So land acquisition for large projects, like you said, mostly this is a case of large projects or highways or big infrastructure coming in. But uh, this is a very unique case because it's ultimately housing and it's uh, one of the basic necessities. Thank you so much for sharing that, Chang. I have just one more question for John. So uh, very rudimentary, this thing. Uh, you've mobilized a teacher's community. You've brought in something very unique uh, in terms of paid time off, in terms of uh, in times of contingency, and that too for a free freelancers uh, group, which is unimaginable usually. Uh, so I, I was just wondering, when you organize yourself as a collective of gig workers or let's say gig teachers, uh, apart from the, the overall intent of providing quality education to and affordable education to students and also a fair uh, uh, salary or earning for the teachers, is there any kind of uh, insurance, contingency or a common fund or something that you keep aside? Uh, for, for any kind of social security for these gig teachers? Yes, well, you know, right now, as we're, as we're starting off, um, you know, we're just starting to build our upfront capital to, you know, just make it over the next couple months. Um, but what we're going to be doing is, yeah, as we go, you know, members are, go we need to be careful with what we're doing because we're in the UK and um, some benefits, you know, with the paid time off, we had to be very careful about that. So we're not classified as an insurance company or as a bank. So <laughs> as we're neither. So there are, you know, some little tricky things involved with that. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, the members are in control. Uh, you know, we get up off our feet, you know, we're still going to turn over our first year. Um, the, the sky's the limit. Teachers are setting their own prices now instead of being forced to sacrifice on a price. So I think that's going to be a real big difference here. Um, you know, and so many online platforms, uh, you know, they have very, very, very strict rules on what you, what content you can use, what material you can use. And you know, the best, the best education is just, you know, is, a, is an honest education. Um, you know, that's how I've always seen it. Um, so, you know, my cool class, we're really going to just kind of be doing a few different things because, you know, we have a model where teachers can bring on their own private students. We have a model where teachers, you know, it's a marketplace, we, uh, a teacher marketplace. 
We have the model where students can find teachers based on the courses they want to take, as well as having teachers come together, create curriculum that many teachers can teach. And, you know, with that um, ladder model that I mentioned, that's where we're going to be able to kind of uh, make things a lot more equal, especially in English teaching, since, you know, that's the, that's the big one around the world, online um, ESL teaching, because teachers will be able to create courses together, which they'll make royalties on. So many teachers are constantly creating content that they never get paid for. It's just extra work just so they can do their regular, you know, lesson. Um, so, by having this, this allows teachers to actually be able to monetize on their hard work that they've, you know, just doing their regular job. Most teachers don't get paid for prep time. Um, so this is going to kind of be a little bit of a, a way to counter that. You know, we're starting off with a seven days paid time off based on, you know, your average income, um, your average daily, you know, salary. But, you know, if if the industry is doing as well as it is, and even if my cool class can come in and make a little teeny small dent and get a little piece of that big pie, um, we're gonna, we, we'll do big things, you know? Um, we'll, we're gonna grow and we'll expand the platform as see fit. A lot of platforms oversaturate them, you know, with teachers on purpose, because these companies, they don't care how many students teachers have. The less students, the more teachers they have, and the less students each individual teacher has, the more profit that company makes. You know, a lot of these platforms will make sure teachers only have two or three students, so they never make the next pay scale or the next pay level or get a raise. So, you know, there's so many, you know, just corrupt practices with online teaching right now. And you know, um, it is going to be a little bit of a process, you know, started with just a couple people. We turned into five. We have six directors now. We have uh, a handful of admin and managers on board. We have people helping out with translations of our website. We have people, I mean, we just have people doing so many different things now. So it is a little bit difficult to make sure everything is organized, under control, done with purpose. People aren't doing the same task or two things that are, you know, um, contradicting each other. So, you know, it it is a real big challenge because, you know, a project like my cool class to actually have an effect. Yeah, sure. We could have started very small. Um, we could have started small with, you know, 20 teachers and built this up. Uh, but again, then that would make overhead incredibly expensive for just a small group of people. Um, and also, yeah, we'd maybe be bettering our lives of the 20 people here, but it's not solving a bigger issue. It's solving personal issues. So, you know, the mission behind my cool class was really to solve a bigger issue, and especially with teachers and education, because everyone knows a teacher in their life. Uh, not everyone knows a fireman or a police officer, but everyone knows a teacher. Um, so being able to spread the cooperative business model through my cool class and teaching all, you know, all around the world, this is also a way of just spreading, you know, cooperative idealism and what it's about. So, you know, there's kind of uh, fights on, you know, different fronts here, you know, fighting, you know, um, for a better wage for teachers, fighting for better education for students, um, you know, fighting the inequalities in education, and also trying to make the world a better place, because, you know, this is not going away, and if anything, this is the, the beginning of, this is still the beginning of what is yet to come in this picture. So, you know, there are, yeah, multiple different, um, you know, fronts here. So, you know, we're, 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 making, we're making mistakes, we're learning from them, we're correcting them. We have lots of competent people from a plethora of different backgrounds and experiences. So the right people are, you know, coming into, um, you know, coming up and say, hey, how can I help? Hey, how can I help? And that's what we want right now. Perfect, perfect. Thanks so much, John. I think you've given us quite a good insight into, uh, you know, uh, how do I start up my platform cooperative 101. Uh, 
so I think uh, the stage you are at is also a very exciting stage, experimenting with tons of things, conducting your own social experiments within your core group as well as your stakeholders. It sounds uh, extremely exciting and uh, good takeaways from your uh, last answer of the conversation itself. Uh, and and it's, it's crazy that, you know, large conglomerates and corporates would rather have see would rather have their own clients or, or users see standard growth rather than you know expand uh, in terms of scale. You know, a lot of teachers are trying to go independent into themselves, but it's very rare someone has all the skills to be good at marketing, financing, graphic design, Absolutely. and you know have everything to go to business for yourself. So you know by building the my cool class brand as a reputable brand that has good qualified teachers um, in a fair and democratic, you know, society for both, for everyone involved, um, you know, teachers are now going to be able to take that brand and make it their own. You know, this is my cool class. You know, that's where I say everyone can the say sense it's of ownership my comes cool in. class. So it does give everyone a sense of collective ownership over it. Hey, I'm a, I'm a co-owner of my cool class. Everyone can can say that. So, you know, that's kind of what we're really pushing, you know, the, the branding and the marketing, it, it is kind of difficult for the teacher perspective because of the lack of knowledge about cooperatives. So, you know, that's really going to be the, the biggest struggle. But I think after we turn over our first year or so, um, I think that this is going to be a, a pretty big success and we'll just continue scaling. We want to start with a thousand teachers in the next couple months. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. The sky's the limit. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. And uh, we look forward to seeing good positive updates in the next six months. I think it's a learning for all of us, the entire community. And this will be a disruptor in, in multiple ways. And I see, you know, most of the panelists today, you've done something remarkable or either disrupted existing systems. And uh, this is amazing, John. And I think we look forward. I mean, I hear great stories from Hera all the time regarding uh, <laughs> the initiatives you do uh, at my cool class, but looking forward in the next few months. So my last question, I would just want to ask uh, Madam Annaline. So um, similar question that, that uh, I asked John. So how do you manage risk and contingency? Because you're working primarily in the primary agricultural sector. And a lot of that has uh, exposure to the vagaries of nature. There is a lot of uh, risk uh, involved. So do you have some kind of uh, coverage or an insurance or something that you will give for your 4,800 odd members? Um, so that's one question. And secondly, uh, uh, what kind of use of technology uh, do, you, do you actually look at at Kamsur Cooperative? Uh, uh, social media, you already mentioned, uh, but other than that, just questions to you. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, how do I manage risk in managing our cooperative? First is make sure that uh, for funding, uh, make sure that most of our sources of funds are from its owners, from its members. We have to limit our external borrowings. Second is uh, risk of uh, inactive members. Not all members are really patronizing the co-op uh, services and products. So that's uh, the, the media comes in. More uh, promotion, more education. We, ha we have to involve our members. We conduct uh, trainings, monthly trainings. Uh, uh, we post to Facebook our updates, uh, status of our cooperative on a monthly basis, on a daily basis. And uh, Insurances. Uh, Philippines is a uh, typhoon-prone areas. Insurance. So our uh, we enrolled our uh, farmers to crop insurance. Also, our loans are in also uh, enrolled in uh, loan insurances. And of course, uh, we make sure that we enter into business that we really uh, help our farmers, that we really uh, in uh, uplift and uh, increase their uh, uh, income. And we monitored how we manage. We monitored the status of each members if there are really uh, uh, development. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we uh, we re we enjoy, we rejoice our uh, successes, and we involve them in in enjoy in celebration of our successes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the lucid answer.
Uh, okay, so I think we've already extended uh, the time, but we'll take these last two questions from Chan. So Navita, the first question is for you. Uh, how does the business model for your foundation work? Is it run by donations or fees for classes? Uh, Navita? Right. Um, so our uh, programs work on a cross subsidization model. So primarily donations is what uh, we have raised from our friends and family, uh, you know, to and also ourselves to kickstart the project and the work that is going on, which we've been able to sustain over the last two years. Uh, but the coming projects, what we uh, what we are doing is some of the projects are, uh, you know, uh, the privileged classes pay for. Uh, pay for it and parts of it is used for the work that we do with the marginalized uh, section. What we've also realized as a not-for-profit organization that works in the environment education space is that, uh, you know, we've applied for a lot of these funding and incubation, uh, you know, projects and things like that. But uh, everyone wants us to show impact and numbers. And for the kind of work that we are doing, which is on a preventive model, it's very hard. So we're tr still trying to figure that out before we really approach, uh, you know, incubations. But that's there, you know, um, in, in our minds. We will get there once we show enough on-ground work, maybe in the next three, four years or so. So it's, it's, it's a tricky space to be in, very honestly. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Navita. Uh, uh, Susanna, we have uh, one question for you also. So uh, it is, how do you grow food in the city of Singapore? Is it by city farming? Thanks, Chan, for asking the question, <laughs> for allowing us to also speak. Um, yeah, so in Singapore, as I, as I mentioned, we only have 1% of land for agriculture. So we actually grow our food on rooftops, uh, car parks, uh, multi-story car parks, as well as uh, indoor, indoors. So we do it more vertical farming, we use technology and the government is actually promoting us to also grow our own food in our own houses. So they have given and distributed free seeds uh, for people to try out and have a hand in farming. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, we are trying to start a movement here and therefore that's why we saw that Urban Orange is very relevant where we connect the communities with not just produce but also future foods grown in the lab. So such as cultured meats because we see the trend of course with the world moving towards 2050 and uh, you know, more and more people living in urban spaces, but then we will be uh, there'll be a shortage of food. That's where uh, we see ourselves supporting in the area of um, shortage of food and food sustainability and security. Yeah, thanks Chan. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Susanna. Even I have a question for you. So I just want to uh, understand, uh, is it that you also try to connect rural communities with urban consumers or is it just the urban communities growing food and then you are helping them with marketing that food? And if you plan to connect rural communities, then how do you plan to facilitate that? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. I think Singapore, we are really small and we don't really have rural communities within Singapore to speak of. Um, it's pretty much 30 minutes from one end to the other and um, and then we are an island. So um, moving forward, we do have plans to expand and that's how we see a different food system. So wherever we go, we plan to be more contextualized and uh, localized to the context of the, the, the place. So for now, we are more focused on city areas, uh, but hopefully when we are able to learn more about other food systems in other places and we can um, you know, connect rural communities with urban areas, that will be the best. And uh, that, that will also be solving a lot of food security and sustainability issues in other places. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. So with this, I would like to thank all our speakers uh, to join and share uh, the wonderful work that you all are doing. It was a very encouraging session for me, especially, and I think the participants would feel the same. I would also like to thank all our participants uh, who've stayed with us for almost two hours now. Uh, before uh, signing off, I would just request all the uh, panelists to switch on their videos and we'll quickly take a screen capture. I would also request my colleagues to switch on their cameras. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, so just uh, to inform all our participants, uh, this was the last session for today. And tomorrow we will be starting day two of the Youth Summit at 10 a.m. India Standard Time. And we are starting with an inspirational talk by a youth entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Deepak Ramola from India. He's a life experience and life lesson uh, expert who collects wisdom from the life uh, experiences of youth and uh, young people and then share it with uh, youth again to help them uh, have a better outlook towards life. So we look forward to this session and we request all of you to please join us tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Stay safe. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Helene. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Chan.